skeptic I am I can't believe you believe in that man We disagree but I still give a damn Your guru assures if you follow his regimen You will become a most excellent specimen The power to live on and on for all days Is right at your fingertips if someone pays um, I'm Russell Blackford, I'm from Australia, I'm a philosopher, I'm a literary critic, I'm a writer, I'm a number of things I suppose, I wear a few hats. Easy installments of 1095 most of what I've written isn't really to do with you know, like scientific scepticism. My current book is called Freedom of Religion in the Secular State, so it's about secularism, it's about the role of government versus the role of religion. And I have a book called Fifty Great Myths about atheism coming out, okay. co-authored with my friend Udo Shuklang. That's out later this year. Uh -huh. And I have a book about human enhancement coming out early next year. So Wait, I've got human enhancement? Human enhancement, so like genetic oh, enhancement, oh, okay. uh, reproductive cloning, those sorts of technologies and what we should do about them. So, oh, that's interesting. So I'm writing yeah, across a number of fields of philosophy. Uh -huh. the writer, yeah. uh, is this your first town? Yes. Is it? And yeah, yeah. have you been enjoying the experience? Oh, I'm having a great time. I'm loving this convention. Yeah. Everyone's so welcoming, the whole feel of the thing so friendly. Uh, yeah, surrounded by all these yeah, friendly, reasonable people. It's yeah. so refreshing. I've, yeah, everybody's been <laughs> so nice. And yeah. have you, um, you know, have you gotten the opportunity to sit in on the talks and things like that? Oh, I've gone to quite a few. I mean, I've been running around. I've been doing like sure, of course. this interview. And I did another interview and straight things. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I've got to quite a bit of it. And yeah, it's been enjoyable. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you're on the philosophy plant. We actually just spoke to Peter was our last interview. Oh, right, so, yeah. uh, so we're kind of on a little philosophy bend right now. Um, so he was talking about the idea of philosophy granting critical thinking skills. Yeah. Do you find that that's like a good use of like philosophical thinking? Yeah. Look, what you really learn in philosophy, if you do it properly, <laughs> is conceptual skills. Mm -hmm. I and mean, people talk about what you learn in a class in informal logic mm -hmm. or indeed a class in formal logic, but you know, I've taught both of those subjects. And sure, informal logic is a very useful subject mm -hmm. and probably... Yeah, a lot of first year students should do that subject. Sure. And quite a few do. But it's deeper than that. What philosophy is really about is you know, rigorous, rational investigation mm -hmm. uh, designed to kind of understand the world we live in, the human condition, ourselves, mm -hmm. how we should live our lives, those sorts of, of questions. And when you get into those questions, you find a lot of what you do is conceptual work. You're trying to work out, what do we really mean in the first place by a good life? Mm -hmm. you know? uh, you know, go back to Socrates in antiquity. He spends all his time going around asking people, well, what do you understand by justice? Mm -hmm. What do you understand by you know, beauty or mm -hmm. goodness or whatever? Try to just get a handle on what the concepts are. Mm -hmm. And I, I made the point you know, in the panel Often those concepts are a mess. Yeah, when we start analysing what we really think those things are, mm -hmm. they become very, very elusive indeed. And there's even questions to whether some of those concepts are coherent. Mm -hmm. Now, learning how to analyse in that way, you know, really think through concepts, whether they're coherent, what they really mean. Is there, is there really just one concept there? Uh -huh. Or are you using a certain phrase? But there's actually a lot of concepts mixed up there that have to be un untangled. Uh -huh. I think that's really more at the core of what philosophy is about than learning not to use an ad hominem fallacy mm -hmm. or, or whatever. Right? Sure. Uh, so your book, uh, it's called 50, 50 Myths About Atheists? 50 Great Myths About 50 great myths Atheism. About atheism. <laughs> not terrible myths. Great, <laughs> great myths. <laughs> and so what was the target audience for that? Was that for kind of atheists just sort of an end thing or was it? Oh, it's a very general educated audience. Uh -huh. you know, uh, uh, it's for theists and atheists. Mm -hmm. It is not written in academic. Or, or, sure. or, or whatever, although, I mean, some of the argument uh, does have to become a little bit technical, mm -hmm. but it seemed that, you know, the sort of wide audience that, you know, we, we guess, you know, Richard Dawkins might reach, or won't reach as many people as Richard reaches, sure. but for the same sort of, uh -huh. of audience, yeah. so, you know, I, I think it should be accessible to a lot of people at that kind of level, you know, college students, mm -hmm. graduates, just people who are interested, as well as having some things there that might be of interest to yeah, you know, to professional mm -hmm. philosophers, sure. and we we have all these myths, these lies or libels or half truths mm -hmm. about 
atheists and atheism, and we try to give them as good a run as we can. You yeah. know, we actually try to find, you know, is there a grain of truth in them? Mm -hmm. You know, are some of them this plausible, or yeah. are they all busted, or, you know, and we sometimes borrow that language from, sure. from myth busters. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, so that's what that's all about. And we have a long chapter at the end where we set out the history of atheism, because it does have a history, mm -hmm. <laughs> And why, in the light of that history, in the light of the way the history of atheism is interrelated with the history of science, mm -hmm. we think that atheism is the yeah you know, the most reasonable answer to the question about God. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you're from Australia, um, and yeah. how is how do you find the culture in terms of the treatment of religion different uh, in the states versus oh, Australia? Australia is much less religious country than mm -hmm. America. It's funny, I, I, I didn't get to it on the panel today, but, but people were saying yet again the difficulties of teaching religious students mm -hmm. and getting them to think critically mm -hmm. and to challenge their own beliefs and so on. That, that is a very different experience from mine teaching philosophy students in Australia. Sure. I mean, we're not taught philosophy of religion classes in, in Australia. The harder part is getting them to take the arguments for religion seriously. Right? Oh, so, really? so it is actually a very different experience oh, in that yeah. sense. Now, that's not to say that all is well in Australia. The sure. religious lobby has a lot of political influence. Mm -hmm. right? So so it's still important that there be doubt cast on religion and there be doubt cast on mm -hmm. the, you know, the moral authority of these sorts of lobbies, the moral authority of church leaders, etc., etc. Sure. That, that's still an issue even in Australia. But, but nonetheless, there is a huge cultural difference. So in, you know, being that Australia is a little bit um, uh, less religious as a whole, are people still really precious about protecting? You know, in, in America, there's certain there's a certain thing of you can't question somebody's faith or you can't uh, kind of yeah, make them second guess that. Do you find it similar in Australia? Yeah, I guess it is. Look, it, it's certainly look, it may have broken down a little bit since mm -hmm. the new atheism came along, right? mm -hmm. but but there has been this thing. I think probably since the 1980s, mm -hmm. where it's kind of bad taste. Um, you know, politically incorrect mm -hmm. to to challenge religion publicly, mm -hmm. and I think that's a universal thing across the Western countries. Really, yeah. partly I think because there was a feeling that religion had lost the game; that it was no longer necessary mm -hmm. to challenge religion publicly, and that certainly proved not to be the case. Right. right? So that was that was one thing, and and of course in the nineteen eighties. And perhaps a bit earlier, there was this big resurgence. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that was one thing. Uh, another thing was multiculturalism. You know, this sense that if you're, you know, there's something culturally imperialistic about Enlightenment values, is the idea, right? right? You know, if, if you're promulgating Enlightenment values rather than some other sorts of values based upon traditional belief, uh -huh. yeah, you know, that is somehow cutting across the the culture of oppressed people. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, that, that's also part of it. There may be other things I can't kill, quickly identify, but there's a number of things that factor into this as to why it's somehow thought, even in a quite secular country like Australia, to be, mm -hmm. to be bad taste or just not the thing that you do yeah. to go criticising religion publicly. Okay, well, you know what? I think that's uh, all we need. Thank you so okay. much for your time. Pleasure. Um, and one more time, your new book is called... Uh, the new book is called 50 Great Myths About Atheism, it's and that's the, the book one. that's coming out in October. Okay, and yeah. people can find that on website? Anywhere. Well, it's, pub it's published by Wiley Blackwell, so it's published by a major academic okay. publisher. So so it should be in, you know, like university bookstores everywhere, and they certainly order it from Amazon or so. whatever. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you. And actually, before you go, okay.